Intelligence agents spend years trying to learn it. Your high school friend that your parents described as the guy with the street smarts somehow managed to tap into it. Even parents, especially those described as parents who have eyes on the back of their heads, have mastered it. The, the thing that I'm talking about, of course, is something called situational awareness. Situational awareness. It's the ability to scan your surroundings, comprehend their meanings, and make quick judgments about what will likely happen and make decisions that you'll need to make as a result of that understanding. Many experts in sports or in military combat theory believe that this skill of split-second assessment is the fundamental ingredient for success in sticky situations. Recently released into theaters was the movie Sully. Maybe you saw it. You certainly know the story. It's a retelling of the heroics and the quick thinking of Captain Sullenberger who was able to quickly assess his surroundings, his situation, and the condition of his aircraft so that he could beautifully and safely land a commercial airline in the Hudson River with no casualties. Situational awareness. We have all seen, probably watching plenty of them on the internet, of the epic failures of those who have no situational awareness. Someone's watching a navigational map on their phone instead, as they walk down the street, and instead of paying attention to oncoming traffic, they walk right out into the street. Or perhaps you've seen the, the videos of the person with their head buried in their phone sending a text walking right into a pool or tripping and falling into a fountain. Situational awareness. It may be fitting for some of our members today to come into worship and find a reading that matches their mood. The end is near. Tumult is upon us. It is my concern at this juncture of our congregation's history that the division about temporal things, temporary things, pushes us to jettison each other's voices, particularly those who are different or diverse from us. True, true leaders know that better decisions are made when there are a diversity of opinions rather than surrounding yourself with input from everyone who thinks like you. There's a danger in that. There's a blindness of situational awareness. A word to the electorate of the liberals and conservatives We've been talking past each other for so long that we can easily divide each other into winners and losers, victors and crybabies, racists and those for whom we're going to help move to Canada. And this rhetoric has been going on long before this election. It's just on steroids now. And everyone seems to be engaged in it from the top down. But now such inability to dialogue has left us unable to understand the fundamental concerns that each brings about the pace and the nature of change in our culture that people are experiencing and among protests today about the fear that is at the heart of those who have felt personally threatened or personally endangered by the elections rhetoric. And if we cannot see, if we cannot see the perspective of the other and appreciate those concerns as real concerns, we are in real trouble because we have little situational awareness and we will walk right into a quagmire. Maybe you feel the stickiness of it already. It certainly didn't just begin. Whether you're a political pollster, a president or CEO, an athlete flying a jet, or someone who wants to cross the street, situational awareness is critical for our success. And Jesus would agree with that. In fact, essentially, our gospel today, we had three doozies of readings today. I'm going to go just with our gospel. That's what Jesus is talking about. In fact, it's exactly the way he's talking about it when he's talking to his disciples in Luke chapter 21. 
in this gospel, Jesus is only days away from the cross. And as a result, his focus has shifted to preparing his disciples for a world that they will be living in after he's risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. There's nothing that clarifies like looking death in the eyes. Some of you that have done it know exactly what I'm talking about. And Jesus is staring at the gruesome cross, but thought not of himself, but of those who would be taking up their cross after him. The disciples had just entered into Jerusalem in this text. They're with Jesus. They're standing on the Temple Mount. If you've ever stood on the Temple Mount, even without a building there, it's still pretty marvelous. And yet this was a temple that was being reconstructed by King Herod. Historians of the first century tell us that it was impressive. It was a wonder of construction in that day, made with massive stones, decorated with gifts from foreign countries, gold gilded, doors and gates made by the finest craftsmen. They are marveling when Jesus interrupts the disciples' observance of the temple's beauty by boldly stating that there is a time that is coming when the temple towering over them will be completely dismantled. Now he goes on from there to talk a little wider than about Jerusalem and the temple, and he says that the earth itself and the nations will, well, we'd say today, freak out. There are going to be rough times ahead, Jesus says. You need to be ready for those rough times with a perspective, with an awareness. You, if you're my disciple, you need to survey the situation. You need to assess what's happening and stay aware. Now, by the time that Luke writes down these words for his community in Luke's gospel, the temple has already been destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Jerusalem has fallen. A dispersion of the population has taken place that results in your neighbors here in Agora being Jewish, the effect of the Romans. The Rome, and Rome renames the territory. They don't want any memory of it. Palestinia is what they call it. And it lasted for millennia. There would be widespread persecution of the church because everybody's looking for somebody to blame when things go bad, you know. Just as Jesus said. And his prediction would go beyond 70 A.D., and the temple's destruction into a far more reaching reminder that there will be hard times ahead until his return. And until then, Jesus calls us to readiness, to watchfulness, and faith-filled situational awareness so that we can stand. Why? Because in the meantime, we as Jesus' disciples, Jesus' representatives on earth, have a job to do. We are to live with spiritual awareness. Think about that. Now, what does spiritual awareness look like? How do we keep ourselves sharp and aware, like Sully, when times turn suddenly dangerous? Likewise, what's at stake if we insist on keeping our eyes glued to other things while the road around us becomes more and more treacherous? First of all, we have to admit that some followers of Jesus wrongly live as if we have the option of opting out of Jesus' call to readiness in Luke 21. Lutherans are pretty good at this. Instead of situational awareness, this is a point, by the way. Anybody taking notes? I don't see any... Oh, Terry, are you, are you in confirmation? <laughs> I meant for the confirmands, but yeah. You could take notes otherwise, yeah. Instead of situational awareness, we have situational apathy. We can opt out by becoming heaven-only kind of Christians who care only to escape the problems of this world by having their heavenly after-party card already stamped. Right? I'm going to skip the main event and just go to the party afterwards. Or we can try to opt out by a lack of spiritual urgency that we can only concern ourselves with, well, ourselves and our times and a robust faith is starved, like Jesus said in that parable about the seed that was planted among the weeds and was choked out by fleshly concerns. Each of these, what, what I call thin-concerned Christians and carnal Christians, 
becomes uncaring about the world around them, which Jesus says demands our attention. Now maybe we've been lulled. I think about that in my own spiritual walk. Kind of a spiritual slumber, you know, I mean, by, by our affluence, really. Even among us that aren't, aren't that affluent. The affluent lulls us, doesn't it? Because the greatest crisis I face is when my favorite TV show doesn't make it into its next season. <laughs> or my favorite sports team is playing at the same time that, that my spouse has tickets to the theater. <gasps> now we can become impressed with the substance of our everyday lives just as the ancient world was with the Herodian temple, which gave the sense that it was unshakable and it would last forever. So we become apathetic toward the plight of others, especially those in need, and we lose perspective on the world. On the other side of spiritual apathy is, is what I would call situational obsession. Many of us have this infection today. There may be some of us understanding that calamity happens to the world and we stare endlessly at the news or the Facebook feed or the terrible tweeting and we take note of all the troubles in our relationships and we look for that final straw and we live in the hand-wringing reality that enslaves us to negativity. Eventually, we will see preachers and teachers who will lay out for us the ones who are most responsible for our woes and will scapegoat them. Some Christians will escape to preachers who will strip the integrity out of Scripture and draw straight lines from current events in 21st century Western culture, First Nation America, to Old Testament prophecies. <laughs> and place labels on modern evil politicians or celebrities that we think are hastening the world's demise. We are a culture more and more irreligious, and yet I hear more and more easily applied a highly Christian term to people these days, they're the Antichrist. Wow. Such mythologizing to presidents, past, sitting, or elect, disengages us from our real work, the work of engagement with the world that's in need. We, in this case, are just a kind of seed choked out by a different kind of concern and fleshly, well, fear in this case, and protectionism. Such situational obsession makes us not available to abide by Jesus' commands and directives. And although Jesus paints us a stark picture today of what the road looks like, he did not do so to stir up our worry and anxiety and that we would stare at it like it was a train wreck about to unfold. Why he tells us these things is for just the opposite reason. Texts like this one, a small piece of what's called apocalypse, and large pieces of it, like the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, these apocalypse, they don't mean terrible things, by the way. The word means revealing. Therefore, we call the last book of the Bible, the apocalypse, a revelation, a revealing. And it's not so much to be a map for us, which often creates all kinds of hand-wringing around, well, chronology, and that we would have some kind of turn-by-turn -turn navigation from Jesus in these texts. But these texts are really meant to des be designed for us to, to understand them more like a framework that would set, one, perspective, and two, limits. Writer Robert Shannon notes that in 1938, there was a hurricane that threatened New the New England coast, and people feared that one of the main arteries into their area, which was a railroad uh, bridge at White River Junction, would be destroyed by the storm. It was going to be a doozy. The danger was averted by some thoughtful person who backed a line of loaded freight cars onto the bridge. 
and the bridge withstood the force of the hurricane because of the weight that it bore. Robert Shannon writes, the weight of our responsibilities weighs heavenly upon us, but that weight may be the very thing that keeps us from being swept away. Is that it? I mean, does God's framework ultimately make us strong to bear the heaviest burdens in the midst of terrible storms? I think that's one of the functions of apocalypse. Situational apathy is blindness that eventually has the capacity to see only the self. Situational obsession is like it. It's driven by fear. It stores up canned goods and guns and invests in gold and closes out the world. Situational awareness gives us an advantage. It is looking around, seeing all that the Savior said would happen with all of its perspective and all of its limits in its power. And being motivated by our sense of peace because of this warning and our preparation that he had of us and our training by coming Sunday by Sunday for such words that are hard to bear, but we understand there's something that we need to be aware of, whether it's cosmic cataclysm or personal existential threat, that we can respond as God's children in the world. Instead, by being obsessed by terror or being apathetic to need. You see, the end result of apathy or obsession is a missed opportunity. Jesus tells his disciples that we are to be prepared for an opportunity to testify. He tells us that this broken world will increasingly show itself to us for what it is. In all the kinds of strife and struggle and persecution that these disciples will be given a chance to share with their friends and with their families and even with their enemies just why the world is broken the way it is and just who Jesus has made and how it can and how it will be better. I think it comes down to kind of three actions today. I backed up a little bit from where I started with this and until the election happened and uh, things started to unravel a little bit in our culture. I think there's three actions that contribute to situational awareness. First of all, let's expand our world by opening our eyes a little wider. Most of us have a pretty small myopic understanding of what the world looks like because we get the acorn thrown on our doorstep every week. Maybe you need to read the news from the global perspective. You know, send us a newspaper from Sweden, will you? Could you translate it first? <laughs> so we have a bigger perspective on what's going on in the global reality with voices beyond the same old voices that we listen to on talk radio who always say the very things we agree with and therefore our situational awareness is damaged. Maybe we should read about real persecution that's happening to real Christians in the world today in publications like Voice for the Martyrs so we can see where we as an American church actually stand in our culture when we cry out against persecution of us. It's not the same, folks. Second, when trouble arises in this life, and trouble will arise, I don't want to you know, cut the bloom off of that warning from Jesus because, you know, Anybody in the room not had any trouble yet? If you raise your hand, I'm sorry to tell you, just give it a little time. So let's pray. Okay, this is the big challenge. You ready? You ready? Let's pray not just for those things to end, but pray for the grace and strength to endure them well. See the difference? Lots of times we're praying for things to come to an end instead of the strength and grace to endure them. Because we have a great opportunity to witness to a world who is obsessed and apathetic and turned in on itself, and such situational awareness in the world will always end us in a quagmire. And Jesus said that we are supposed to be important change agents, light to reveal things, salt to flavor it up, yeast, 
to get things really popping. That's our job. That's witnessing to the love, mercy, and grace of God who hasn't given up on a world yet, or America either. We begin today by training. Now, I know, we're Lutherans. We don't train for anything except coffee hour. We have to train ourselves. Do you know that Sully, you know, that was the first time in the cockpit for him when he landed the plane in the Hudson River, right? First time. First time he ever practiced that. No. It might have been the 10,000th time he had practiced a crisis landing. What set him apart? It wasn't a novice. He didn't sit in the cockpit and let somebody else drive it for him. He had a faith and a skill that was real and tried and true. Stop sitting here listening to me and start doing it. You didn't get up. That's kind of a good sign. <laughs> Begin today by training yourself in the spiritual life to have maturity and spiritual awareness in all things. People in the Tuesday morning Bible study always marvel when we talk about movies, and I see the spiritual connection. Oh, I want to go see a movie with you. No, just train yourself to see things from a spiritual point of view. You can do it. God is around us all the time. Open your eyes and your heart to where God is, which is always around us. Jesus said, I'll be with you to the end of the ages. In other words, he's still here. This is not an abandoned world. There's still hope. And open that kind of spiritual awareness to know that God will bring glory and give others the opportunity to draw close to that truth and to find peace, not because we've avoided the trouble, but because our witness has endured trouble with grace. Last, while we keep our eyes open to the world, let our hearts be set on what God promises so that we know that the reality of the temporal and the temporary are secured by the eternal. Oh, you are unfortunate. There's time left, so I'm going to tell you another story. <laughs> you get more than the second service. Some of you are going, well, we're going to show up at 11 next week. October afternoon in 1982, if you're a sports fan, you know this story. Badger Stadium, Madison, Wisconsin. It was packed. 60,000 die-hard Badgers of the University of Wisconsin were watching their football team take on the Michigan State Spartans. If you know anything about Michigan State in those days, they had a strong team. And it soon became obvious that the Badgers couldn't stand up to the Spartans, as their teams might imply. What seemed odd, however, was that as the score grew more and more lopsided in that stadium, there were bursts of applause and shouts of joy from the Wisconsin side of the stands. How can you cheer louder when your team is getting routed? It turns out that in 1982, 70 miles away, the Milwaukee Brewers were beating the St. Louis Cardinals <laughs> in the third game of the World Series in 1982. Many of the fans in the stands, like that conflict between sports events and theater, had conflicts between sports events and sports events, and they were listening to their radios, because we didn't have cell phones then, and responding to something other than their immediate circumstance. You get the connection. Paul encourages us to fix our eyes on what is not seen, but what is eternal. That's 2 Corinthians 4. We know from the Gospels that Jesus has a concern for this world. God has an undying, an unmatched love for this world. And we see in Scripture God's love and God's plan for its redemption. And we read about the disciples, and whenever they say disciples, just say you, and our place in that plan. And we see the circumstances in which we find ourselves living today with such situational awareness anchored in the undying and unchangeable grace and mercy of God. Jesus says we can rejoice even in hardships because we can see Christ's larger victory and we can be for the world a credible witness for the saving path of the way of Jesus. May God give us courage. More importantly, 
grace. To be the body of Christ. You know, that's what the New Testament says you are. I am the body of Christ. I am the body of Christ. You are His hands. You are His feet. To this world, you are His very presence. In and for the world today. That's a great upgrade. And also ought to be a great encouragement and a great challenge to awaken from apathy or be shaken free from obsession, to have awareness of God's need for you in the world today, right here and right now, to be a credible witness to the pathway of the way of Jesus. Amen.